Okay, are you seeing my screen? Um, give it a minute. Yep. Yep. Let's come up. All right. So thanks, Pratik. Um, hi everybody. I'm Vincent here. I'm the lead technologies for networking and security at VMware here, and I'll, I won't be doing the presentation and demo myself. I will have my colleague Kuma, who's a AVI specialist, RV specialist. Uh, he's based in Melbourne to help me with the, some of the um, products, presentation as well as solution and demo. So let's start the discussion a little bit um, on discussing application transformation. What are the three drivers that are fueling this application transformation? So the first of we see it's the patterns, the application patterns. And more and more applications are developed in a microservices architecture. I'm sure many of you all uh, on this meetup manners would have, um, you know, familiar with this, right? So uh, with the microservices architecture way of development, development uh, you are able to support innovation, better scaling, uh, better resiliency, and uh, all the self-healing features, all this kind of goodness you get with a microservices architecture. So that's one pillar fueling the transformation. And the second is also with um, the development of uh, such applications, the personas, the people has to transform as well. So we are seeing the rise of the DevSecOps team or the platform teams um, coming up to, to kind of close the gaps between the developers as well as the infrastructure team. So what they actually um, build or practice is platforms and uh, processes to deliver high quality and uh, security of uh, the applications and moving them to production much more faster and more frequently. So this is a little bit uh, what we call like continuous uh, delivery over here. And last but not least, we are also seeing a lot of customers moving to uh, cloud, getting away from their data centers or moving, uh, transforming their data centers or modernizing their data centers um, to become more cloud, uh, cloud-like. So, well, I guess it's, uh, as if you look at the situation today, you know, people can't really get out of their data centers, but it's more like they are getting out from the, the practices that they have been using before, right? So what they do with their data center is right now is trying to modernize it um, so that they behave more like the public cloud. So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about the personas and the people side of things. Uh, as I mentioned, there's these three groups, big groups of people that are talking about, the developers, the DevSecOps team, as well as the infrastructure. So prior to this um, DevOps kind of culture, right? Before that, I'm pretty sure many of you all would know, maybe you talk about over the last uh, 15, 20 years, you know, the application team basically, when they require something, they open a ticket, and um, somebody from the infrastructure team will try to uh, fulfill it, right? Whether is it something to do with compute, networking, or storage. But as the developer teams tries to modernize the, uh, the applications or doing some form of application modernization, the interaction between the developer and the infrastructure team has changed. And we are definitely seeing, uh, of course, there's a rise of uh, the operations team to kind of bridge this gap between the developer and infrastructure. So the developer wants to talk more high level kind of context. It talks about services, APIs. And then when you talk about the operations teams, they need to translate all this interaction to be more some form of automated uh, pipelining and things kind of things. So they would expect, um, you know, decorative interfaces from infrastructure like APIs and things like that. So it, so the thing here, if you look at application transformation, right, other than the technologies had to change, 
the interaction between um, different functions within the organization has to change as well. Okay, so what do we actually mean by that? And let's deep dive, um, you know, in in one of the areas which is networking. So if you if you think about networking, um, you know, it's presented in the OSI layer, like layer one, all the way from physical to layer seven application. The way how apps owner or developers actually talks to infrastructure is always in the, using the notion of IP address, right? So, hey, Vincent. Uh, hello, Vincent. Uh, just Mark, uh, are you sharing your slides? I mean, uh, we are still on slide one, which is the introductory. Yeah, slide. I'm, I'm actually uh, moving the slides. You, you guys cannot see. No. No. Nah, still on okay. slide one. Okay. Let me try to share again. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, let me try sharing my entire screen. So hopefully. Are you seeing the slides right now? Coming up. Yep, now I can see slide four. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, probably I'll just glance through the slides a bit. So this is where I talk about the interactions between the different teams. And now I'm deeping, uh, deep dive into the networking stack, right? So as I was mentioning, um, the way that how application owners as well as infrastructure owners, they, they use this you know, notion of IP address to communicate between the teams. Right, kind of you know, make a very clear demarcation point between like, the different teams, like how it hand off. So for example, like doing provisioning you know, the application owner says that, hey, you know, what are the IP addresses that I can actually use for my applications, right? Whether it's an email, web application, or FTP. And um, and then the infra, the infra owners will say, the networking team will say, okay, are, this is the subnet you can actually use, right? So they actually use IP address to communicate within the teams itself. The other thing is like, let's say for example, if something uh, happened to the application, maybe it's, slow their slowness in the applications then of course the apps owner will say hey you know uh, networking team can you please go and troubleshoot um you know this is the ip address of my servers and this kind of thing right again right ip address is being used here so so now with application transformation we are seeing a shift over the way how uh the different teams are uh interacting right of course you know, other than just the apps owner as well as the infra owner, we are seeing the rise of this DevOps SRE platform team over here. So the way that how it interacts um, between the ops and the infrastructure owner, yep, is still using IP address. But however, um, you know, the technologies or the solutions that used to support the transformation has, has also evolved. So now we are talking about software-defined networking, virtualization. We're talking about distributed services, distributed firewall, distributed load balancing. Talking about end-to-end -end encryption, mutual TLS, right? Service mesh kind of thing. So the the DevOps teams has to be knowledgeable about all these different solutions and, and technologies, and they have to still translate it back to IP address uh, when it talks to the infrastructure owner. But as you can see, right, they are actually abstracting this stack of solution from the apps owner. So the apps owner and developers today don't talk about IP address anymore. They talk about API services. They talk about their applications. They talk about, you know, their gRPC, uh, REST protocol, what are the uh, API services that they are available to use, right? So as you can see, the interaction now has evolved and it, it has become more abstracted and higher context now. So with the understanding of this, um, you know, when we look at the infrastructure um, to support these application trans transformation needs, the infrastructure has to change, right? As well as, uh, um, you know, a little bit on the uh, business side, they also have to change. So what we are, what we at VMware, we are trying to do over here is to provide this set of technologies over here 
uh, kind of like you can treat it as like Lego pieces where you can actually use them to piece up a solution to support your uh, application, application transformation or your modern apps. Okay, so like for example, if you look at this from the infrastructure side, when it talks about network virtualization, right, be it whether routing, switching, firewalling, where you want to do it in a, in a, your private cloud or you want to do it in a more software defined um, based fashion, right? So we have the NSXT data centers to help with that, right? So moving a little bit to the layer four, layer seven stack, then we have the NSX advanced load balancer to help with, with software based kind of load balancing, DNS, GSLB, uh, to provide, for example, multi-cluster, multi-site uh, load balancing requirements. So moving, extending from the, the virtual machines or the instances that you have in the cloud, where now you're saying that, okay, you need to develop your application is more in a microservices way, right? So we also have all these technologies uh, being extended into containers and they are in the form of some form of orchestrator linking up between the uh the controller as well as the services that you that you require so for example like layer 7 ingress cluster load balancing dns kind of services right so we have entra which is an open source uh, uh project uh that we have right and it, it, it functions as a container network interface it functions as providing micro segmentation for your containers right again ncp uh, NSX container plugin, extending the network virtualization to your container space where we provide like IP address management, distributed firewall, micro segmentation for your containers. So again, we also have NSX ALV over here to provide like ingress controller services, uh, DNS automation uh, for all your uh, Kubernetes environment. And last but not least, to pull everything together, um, also and, and pulling all the services together, we have the service mesh, right? Tanzu service mesh, which provides you with like API security, uh, visibility into your microservices, uh, threat prevention for your microservices, right? As well as uh, providing uh, high value use cases for your uh, application as well. So as you can see, we have multiple different kinds of technology and solutions over here you can, of course, use them standalone, or you can actually use them in an integrated fashion, right? So for example, you know, if you want to enable um, a high availability use case for your, um, you know, multi-clusters Kubernetes in the cloud, you can actually use Tanzu Service Mesh and NSX ALB together to provide, um, you know, those kind of services, right? And of course, there is also WAF web application firewall in NSX ALB. So, you know, for example, in the future, you might want to turn on web application firewall services for your microservices. It's just a few um, API calls, and you are able to do that uh, for your applications. So, it's going to take us a long time to cover all these different technologies over here. So, today, you know, um, we're going to focus on the NSX ALB over here, right? I think the other time, um, the previous talk, we actually show you a little bit in the, in a, uh, this meetup talk, we also talk about, we talk about the Tanzu Service Mesh integration with NSX ALB, right? For the Kubernetes environment. So today, we, we I thought maybe we should uh, switch gear a bit and talk about how NSX ALB actually helps you to provide this consistent experience for your, all the different kinds of workloads whether they are running on-prem or in the multi-cloud. So I'm going to hand over to Kuma over here so that he can actually share more about the NSX ALB solution with you all. Perfect. Uh, thank you, uh, Vincent. Yeah, let me pass to you the... Yeah, if you can pass me the board, please. And uh, thanks a lot for setting up the scene and and you know sharing let me know if you guys are able to see my screen uh, yeah. yes cool are you able to see my my screen and the slide deck uh yeah we can see the screen um 
I am not sure if this is the slide deck. Can you go forward on your slide? I think this is just your screen. Oh, okay. Need help contact Oasis. Are you like, using the screen? Oh, let me share the entire screen as Vincent did. How about now? Uh, yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. And I was saying thank you, Vincent, for uh, giving us the use case uh, that uh, you have come across and in terms of how the application architecture has proliferated uh, from on-prem to cloud and to microservices environment and, uh, and then uh, various entanglements of, uh, you know, of the proliferated uh, application architecture and then how uh, network and other infrastructure elements piece together to bring up the solution. But then, as you said, you know, load balancing is uh, something, a critical piece, which any, every, any and every business ready application requires to, uh, to be hosted upon. And based on that, you know, uh, we bring uh, uh, VMware NSX Advanced Load Balancer uh, is there in the market, which is a layer four to layer seven enterprise grade application services platform. And uh, when we say it's an enterprise grade platform, you, know, you require uh, uh, an LTM, which is a load balancer to make your application resilient and for uh, SSL termination and a lot for other purposes, which is pretty well known to us. But then uh, for, make, for making the application uh, resilient, uh, it has to be multi-geographically available and business ready. So for that, it's required a, a global traffic manager or GSLB, what we call it. And then to make application uh, security proof because uh, applications are business today and, and they are susceptible to, to uh, well-known uh, well attacks and you know, DDoS uh, attack are pretty, pretty common. And that's where we, uh, we integrate web application firewall and, and complete application security suit into the NSX advanced load balancer. And uh, as uh, Vincent said, it is container ingress services ready platform. And the key differentiator that platform brings is that it has a rich analytics and observability built into it. And then also for that automated uh, virtual services deployment, there it has DNS and IPAM ready. So IPAM so that we can allocate IP addresses dynamically to the load balancers and also to the virtual service deployment. And then uh, you require an FQDN attached to, uh, to that IP address to make it user friendly uh, to access the application. And that's where it has a DNS also inbuilt and it can also go and integrate with other DNS servers. And so this platform uh, is also known as Avi. Uh, I mean, it has been out there, uh, Avi was, uh, came out first in 2012, and it was acquired by VMware in 2019. And, and as much this platform is integrated with VMware ecosystems, uh, ecosystem and its product, it can also run as an independent uh, load balancer with any other platform, you know, say Azure, AWS, OpenStack, OpenShift, et cetera. So that's where we say, you know, you, uh, it is a platform where, which can be used to deliver any application across any cloud and using a single platform. Now, let's just delve quickly into, into the architecture and how uh, a software-defined architecture is really makes, brings that differentiator as compared to the other and the legacy uh, application delivery platform architectures. So in, uh, uh, as per the software-defined principles, uh, you, we have separated the control plane and the data plane where control plane is where the controller uh, of uh, the NSX or uh, advanced load balancer sits. Uh, it is the, the brain and the heart of the whole system. Whereas uh, uh, down there is the data plane where the service engine sits. Now, when we say service engines, these are the actual load balancers or the work halls. We, uh, we sit in front of the applications, the client interact with the service engines in the data plane, whereas uh, an administrator would always go and log in into the RV controller. And 
uh, now because the RV controller controls all the SEs uh, which are sitting or the load balancer sitting in the data plane, the, the load balancers can, as a result, be provisioned across any environment, which is your on-prem environment or a public cloud environment and across any form factor. So across your bare metal, virtualized or a containerized environment. As a result, the key differentiator of the features that it bring is, is first thing that this whole fabric uh, is centrally orchestrated. Now, when I say centrally orchestrated, RV controller uh, uh, is the place where an administrator would always log in and, and would write the intent as to what it want to do with the application. And as a result, the RV controller uh, would store the configuration and then in a very declarative fashion, it will go and look into uh, the availability of the resources. It will place the load balancer in that particular environment and then uh, and then provision the virtual service on top of it. This all is done in a very automated fashion. At the same time, as a, uh, another feature that as a result it brings is that it makes the whole data plane uh, pretty elastic. Now, when I say elastic, in case more throughput is required down the future, uh, you just need to have an underlying x86 compute available and you can spend more load balancers or the SCs in this scenario. So you don't have to uh, provision for your application delivery platforms uh, for next three to five years. You can start with what is required today and then scale as in, uh, in uh, for future. And another additional benefit that it brings is that it makes the whole platform resilient. Now, because controller is the brain and the heart of the system, it is monitoring the whole data plane. Uh, and in case there is an uh, issue with a load balancer, or we call it SE, a service engine, you know, what it will do is it will automatically spin another SE uh, in that in that environment, it will automate and it will migrate the virtual service on that new SE, and then it will do its uh, its uh, uh, investigative uh, investigation as to what happened to the previous SE. Then it brings uh, it brings a rich automation that is built into this platform because the, uh, this whole platform is based is built on REST APIs. Uh, the the uh, you know, you interact with the GUI and and uh, the CLI based on the REST APIs. As a result, we have exposed and gone and exposed these REST APIs with uh, other third-party well-known automation tools, which we'll discuss a bit further. And and uh, uh, so so uh, the whole day zero, day one, and day two operations can be managed. But there's a lot of automation that is built inside uh, inside the platform itself because it has an APIs into it. It can manage the load balancers which are running in your AWS, Azure, or on-prem environment and multi and uh, various other clouds. And because the, the whole data plane is being controlled by the controller, the traffic that is passing through the SEs in the data fabric, they feed all the logs back into the controller. So because the controller is the, is the central management plane, it can do, uh, there is AI and uh, machine learning that is running into the controllers, which can give that uh, rich end-to-end -end visibility into the application performance, which I would actually show you into the demo further. And uh, cherry on the top, what we have done is for, for central license management, uh, we have uh, the cloud based uh, service called RV Pulse, uh, which helps in, in managing your licenses uh, centrally into the cloud. And what additional benefit RV Pulse brings in, uh, because we have WAF, we can do, uh, we can do uh, signature database updates, IP reputation, geolocation database updates. And, and also another service that it brings is that we, we can also do proactive, uh, provide that proactive support. So in case there is some issue that controller sees, it can take a configuration dump and open uh, open the, the VMware uh, tag ticket. So by the time uh, in, in the middle of the night, there is some issue, there is a call home service, an email or a phone call that an engineer receives, he comes and log in into, uh, to look into what is happening. There would already be a, a support engineer who would be looking into the configuration and finding out where the issue has been. So let's look into some of the popular use cases that uh, this platform 
uh, brings in and where it has been used. So as we have said, uh, as uh, we've said, it can be used in, into any environment. So even your, your software defined data centers on on-prem and these are one of the very popular uh, use cases, uh, but not limited to just these use cases. So your instead in your on-prem environment, NSX, BCF, BR Metal, OpenStack, public cloud, nearly every public cloud. I mean, we have the inbuilt APIs for Azure, AWS, Oracle, GCP, but then people are using it in Alibaba uh, and, and uh, all the other well-known cloud platforms. Similarly, container, uh, there is, we have uh, ingress controller that makes the whole uh, 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 container operations automated from the, from the perspective of uh, virtual service provisioning. So, so uh, it is well integrated into the Kubernetes, VMware Tanzu, OpenShift, and, and all the well-known public cloud container platforms. And similarly for end-user computing, which is VMware Horizon virtual desktop environment, it is a go-to platform to use. And on top of it, uh, it comes with all the, all the rich uh, all the rich features that are required to make that uh, make the application business and market ready, which is your LTM, GSLV, application security WAF, and container ingress services. So, as a result, why NSX ALB? What what benefits or or the you know the uh, or the uh, richness that it is bringing is first that it you know the the software defined architecture that it has it helps in consistent delivery of your applications across multiple clouds because it helps in standardization of the application delivery using load balancing GSLB WAF solutions across multiple cloud. Then it has uh, 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 integrations with all the well-known uh, platforms. It helps in driving the troubleshooting a lot more easier because of its rich analytics and visibility that it provides into the application performance, which I'll be able to showcase in part of our demo today. Then uh, another good part is you know, it helps in, in uh, reducing your uh, re uh, reducing your cost of ownership of the platform because you don't have to over provision for for next three to five years because it is it is elastic. Your uh, you know uh, if more throughput is required, you just require more x86 compute. So in case uh, uh, in future, more more is needed. You don't have to change. You can just uh, uh, horizontally expand. And then it's a uh, it's a universal solution. It's not a point solution where you have to buy separate hardware module or services. All the features, well, like load balancing, GSLB, WAF, are part of a single platform, all inbuilt. And I've briefly touched on automation, but I would like to touch on this particular point uh, over here that you know, as the platform is built on REST APIs, uh, uh, so, so when you interact with the GUI and the CLI, it is all based on the REST APIs. As a result, we are able to expose those REST APIs to all the well-known operational automation and infrastructure uh, automation tools, which is uh, you know, in your, your VRO, uh, VRO, VRA, Ansible, uh, uh, Terraform, etc. Whereas when we talk about the uh, infrastructure automation, there is a rich APIs that are inbuilt, which go, uh, which helps in interacting the, the platform with the uh, well-known public cloud platforms and and your infrastructure platforms, so that uh, the virtual services can be provisioned automatically into into the environment where an application resides. So what it would do is it will go and look for uh, look for uh, underlying compute if uh, the compute is available through the API. It would interact with your with your uh, with your account in AWS or Azure. It will spin up a EC2 instance over there, uh, deploy operating system. Uh, the load balancer operating system, the load balancer will be up, and then it will go and deploy a virtual service uh, in front of your application. It's up and ready. So, so uh, the, the work that was required to be done in days can now be condensed and be done in a couple of minutes. So that's the, that's the richness of automation and self-service that it brings. And then at the same time, it has analytics and uh, insights, uh, which is which uh, 
uh, uh, we talk about and which is a key differentiator of this particular uh, platform because uh, uh, the controller is managing all the load balancers in the data in the data fabric. So all the traffic that is flowing across from the SEs are is being fed back into the controller. So SEs don't have to uh, care about the visibility uh, and uh, the visibility of the uh, of the traffic because uh, because it uh, it can concentrate in faster delivery of the application. As a result. Controller, which is sits into the control plane, uh, is idle from is idle from the function of application delivery. As a result, what uh, the compute in the controller is being used to to uh, 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 extract the uh, metrics. So we calculate uh, we uh, extract nearly seven hundred metrics out of that data flow, and through the uh, through the AI and the ML, we are able to piece that information together and present the application, the end-to-end -end application performance, and and also the logs in a very human-readable format. And I will demonstrate you in the uh, in the demo. And let's quickly touch on uh, and onto the intelligent WAF that is also inbuilt as part of the system. Now, um, every time we talk to an application or, uh, owner or to the infrastructure team to so deal with applications, everybody say that uh, you know, uh, web application firewall or application security is key to any application in the business environment. As a result, we have uh, built the, the intelligent WAF, which is part of the solution itself. It is not a point solution. Uh, it is not a separate hardware, it is inbuilt into the platform and, and it offers all the application security services that are required for, for application protection right from layer three, layer four, seven access list, user authentication, advanced malware protection, uh, DDoS protection, rate limiting, bot management, and uh, the web application firewall, which would have your OWASP top 10 protection and attack analytics and it is certified by ICSA Labs today. And then to, to, uh, um, to make that uh, application, uh, um, the security or the threats or the vulnerabilities that are flowing through, we have rich, we provide that rich security insights through our application visibility platform. Now, a couple, uh, and what were the, the core design principle on which we have built this particular platform uh, is that, uh, the, the WAF is definitely key to application security, but at the same time, it is really hard to implement. Because, why? Because first, it is highly CPU intensive, so it can impact the system in a big way when, uh, you know, when there is a lot amount of traffic is passing through it and it, is, and it is always hitting those signatures. So as a result, it can, it can take a toll on to uh, toll onto the application performance. Also, at the same time, and another uh, uh, another issue with BAF uh, or has been that it is really has been really difficult to to fine tune. So so the lot of uh, the lot of chattiness or the lot of false positives that are being uh, that are being uh, thrown out, uh, it becomes difficult for the uh, for the infrastructure teams to fine tune those uh, those signatures and reduce the false positives. So as a result, in most of the environments we have seen that either MAF has been turned on or it has only been implemented in enforcement mode where it has never seen a light to move into a detection. Uh, and uh, it has only been into detection state and it has never seen or moved into an enforcement mode. So in order to, in order to simplify uh, uh, signature fine tune, uh, the signature tuning, uh, uh, and and also to address the issue of uh, of uh, 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 high resource intensive function, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this platform uh, brings that differentiator. Why? Because because uh, first it has a rich visibility and insights where it uh, you know it gives that end to end visibility of the application, and and through it 
yeah, it, it is pretty easier to, to fine tune or, or tune the signatures, but also at the same time, if more throughput is required, it is easily to scale uh, elastically. And as a result, uh, if, even if the path is turned on and you see more, uh, uh, there is a resource hit, you can add more load balancers or, or more CPU to your load balancer and it will be able to cope up. And how do we do that? So there are three engines that we run the traffic through. So first is the allow list, which is self-implied that in case an application owner says, I know what sort of URL application or client IP it is, and I, and I want to allow it to pass through, he, uh, uh, he can uh, be put it into allow list. As a result, the traffic passes through it. Then is the positive security, which is one of the key engine and the differentiator over here. Uh, which uh, where we do a lot of behavioral analytics for uh, for the traffic that is passing, and as a and slowly and slowly, uh, if there is a consistent pattern, that particular application will be automatically moved into positive allow list. If there is a, a spike or a dip in that particular uh, uh, pattern, then what it would do is. Uh, or if there is uh, a, uh, you know, there is a different URL than uh, than a consistent URL that has been passing, what it will do is it will pass that traffic to the signature engine. As a result, over the period of time, very less and less amount of traffic is being passed across to the signature engine, uh, to which is which is usually the highly resource intensive part to to scan through. So. So this is how we are able to reduce the false, false positive and make the overall WAF uh, pipeline more performant and scalable. And, and so you can see this is, this is how we, uh, you know, we are able to deliver a scalable and a performant platform for uh, even when we have WAF inbuilt into, into the fabric. Any questions so far? Cool, I will move into the demo. Uh, let me know if you're able to see my screen. No, I'm still not able to see your screen. Yeah, yeah. in progress. Connecting. Uh, yep. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Maybe you want to increase the zoom, uh, zoom in a little bit. Yep. I think that works. Yep. Okay. So in our demo, we will go through uh, three main areas. Uh, the first thing, uh, the first will be, uh, will be how do we uh, the analytics uh, and the performance. Uh, uh, part of uh, how this platform is able to, to piece that information together and provide that in a very human readable format. The second would be, we'll look into a scenario where you know, how easy it is to troubleshoot uh, using, using this platform with that, uh, with that rich visibility that we have. And it helps in, uh, in uh, 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 the troubleshooting a trivial scenario of like application latency and achieving that business uh, operational app excellence and the, and thirdly we will also look uh, we'll also go and provision a virtual service into one of the cloud environment and uh, and how e and we'll see how easy it is to provision an application so uh, first of all once you log uh, once you log in into the platform this is the screen that you land in and you would actually you would move get into the admin tenant. So what you see over here on a bit on the right hand side, I have uh, my controller which is running into San Francisco at this particular state, but I have a couple of other controllers which are running in uh, various other regions, and uh, and I could manage all these controllers from a single pane of glass. So it is a multi federated system. At the same time, the whole platform is uh, built on principles of multi tenancy. Where I can have, I can configure multiple tenants and and have my virtual services provisioned into these tenants. One of the great use cases of these uh, of multi-tenant model is that now I can uh, the the 
management of the virtual service in these tenants can be handed over to the application teams themselves where they can manage the applications during their application change windows uh, uh, by themselves. As a result, a simple task of like bringing a virtual service up and down or even redirecting to virtual splash page during their application change window can be done by, by the application teams themselves. They don't have to be dependent on the, the network team and wait for two to three weeks to get a change window. And uh, people are, and uh, the users are even using uh, this model to uh, to uh, have a self-service portal and in, or integrate it with ServiceNow, where application teams can provision their own own virtual services for their applications, whereas the overall platform management is being done by by the platform team. And third and very interest, uh, interesting uh, feature set that a multi-tenant model brings in that all my load balancers that are running in these tenants can now, uh, I can uptake the upgrade of my load balancers on per tenant level. So uh, as you see over here, my load balancers running in via tenant can now be upgraded on a Monday, in demo tenant on a Tuesday, and in a marketing tenant on a Thursday. So I don't have to deal, deal with a monolithic box, which is running all my virtual services and just uh, think from an exam, uh, think that if I have to upgrade that particular box, uh, you know, what sort of a change process and, and a time window uh, one has to go through as compared to, uh, uh, as compared to a per tenant upgrade model makes life a lot more easier. From here on, I move into my demo tenant so, and I have multiple applications which are running in different environments. And I, as a result, I have virtual services that are running in, uh, in uh, different environments. So I have this application running in a VMware, uh, in an on-prem uh, VMware environment. Uh, my application number two running in an AWS environment and over here, this one running in Azure environment. And I'm managing all these applications through a single uh, through a single dashboard. Even if I go over here and create a virtual service, it will actually ask me, you know, where do I want to provision my virtual service? Uh, as in where my applications are residing. And this is configurable. So uh, at the moment on my demo, I have uh, uh, three, uh, uh, three environments which are ready, but uh, I, can, I can go and configure a lot more uh, into, uh, into the platform. If I go into my RV demo virtual service, right over here, uh, it's a pretty interactive GUI, right? Where I, it actually shows me what are my pool groups and what are my pool members and what is the state of my pool members over here. So right from here, I get a very rich visibility as to what is happening into this particular application where if there is somebody is trying to sort out images from, uh, in, from this application, it is going to uh, pool, so, uh, pool member a, whereas if they are trying to do some, uh, if there is trying to do some sort of an upload, it is going to pool member B, and then rest is going to pool member C. So I'm getting a lot of a uh, 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 lot of information right from uh, here from uh, from the virtual service. And uh, but I think a very interesting question that you might ask over here: These are the applications, but where are the load balancers? So down over here, if you see, are my two load balancers. So this application is actually uh, running on uh, two load balancers over here. Uh, so it is an active, active fabric. And I can actually scale to run my application up to 64 load balancers in this scenario. Or even if I can, uh, and when it is not required, I can scale back to one, uh, one SE. Now let's look into the health of this application. And if I see you know, this application, uh, it, uh, it shows that uh, uh, it's giving me the he overall health of my application. And we categorize the health of the application on four parameters, which is performance as to how my pool members are, are performing and resource penalty in terms of you know, how my SEs are performing is uh, what is the resource utilization on my SEs on anomaly penalty, if there is a deviation from a, a regular pattern uh, or the pattern 
uh, or the behavior of the traffic there, uh, which means if there's a spike or there's a drip, uh, it would give me an anomaly penalty. And then there is a security penalty in terms, you know, if there are weak ciphers that are flowing through, if there is a uh, expired cert, uh, in that scenario, it will actually give me a security penalty. And through a backend algorithm that we run, give me an overall health score, which is 47. Now, it is not very good. It is not very bad. Why? Because one of my spool member is down and I have a security penalty that is going through. As a result, my health score is 47, so it's, but it is pretty average. Hey, Kuma, is, there's a question over here. Like, why, why is one of the pool member okay. red color? You might want sure. to so, address uh, it. Yeah. So I go back to, into the tree view of my applications. And so this particular, so, uh, this pool member is, is at the moment it is down. So what it's, it is showing is that uh, it would, uh, as I said, it gives that output in a very readable format. It says that it is down. It's, it's a fake server that we are running. Uh, and and it is down for the purpose of uh, for of this particular demo, but then but then uh, for 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 the information perspective, uh, it could it could quickly show that right over here it could uh, we I'm getting that information. I don't have to dig deep into into various pages to find it out what has happened to my pool member. Yeah. We, we basically like do health monitoring to the servers itself and you can even customize uh, the health monitors and you know and you can even stack up the health monitors if you want to so that it can actually provide you with better uh, mechanism to know whether your server is alive what's the load in your servers and things like that yeah cool. oh, thanks thanks Vincent no no yep. and I've been uh, talking about the rich analytics and observability that this platform Brings, this is what I have been uh, I have been talking about, and this is a real uh, uh, a real differentiator for this particular platform because we are able to give an end-to-end -end performance of the application, uh, and right from the client RTT to the time that the packet has uh, spent into my environment, and uh, to a level what has been the application and the data transfer rate. So over here, if you see. Uh, my, uh, for the past six hours, the average value of my application performance has been 67 milliseconds. And if and I could actually give that information in a graphical in a graphical format. And if you move across this graph, this information is available right at a you know, to from a minute to minute level. So what we are doing is we are collecting nearly 700 metrics from from the data traffic that is passing through the data plane, feeding into the fab, uh, into the controller, and the controller could run its magic to actually produce this kind of uh, 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 kind of graph. And uh, uh, so, and this is really helpful in actually uh, in actually bringing that uh, business excellence because now uh, the the infrastructure or the network teams can quickly uh, quickly figure out you know what has been. Uh, what has been the various parameters from the perspective of how my network is performing, how the server response time has been, or how the application response time has been. And think it's from the perspective of, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from you know, in case there has been an issue with network uh, 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 application latency, uh, where usually uh, the first line of troubleshooting end with, it usually ends with the network or the infrastructure team. And, and it's always becomes a network problem. But using this kind of tool, a network, uh, a network administrator or an infrastructure administrator can quickly tell you know, how, uh, how the overall parameters have been. Let me just quickly go back past 30 minutes and we can actually go past, now we can even go back up to you know, an year depending upon the disk size that is available. And, and uh, that kind of rich data you know, over here, I could see that uh, the overall application, uh, uh, the end-to-end -end application response has been 153 millisecond, whereas over here it has been 42.9 milliseconds. And what has been the uh, what has been the difference out of uh, out of these two? Uh, and in this scenario, it has been a client RTT which has been the issue, whereas uh, in uh, I mean in this one as well, it has been a client RTT. Or uh, probably let me go back to pass 
six hours. And at the same time, I mean, in the meantime, it, it uh, kind of loads the whole value. Uh, over here, if you could see, you know, there are a lot of other metrics that we are capturing in terms of the virtual service metric, and like end-to-end -end timing, throughput, open connections, connections, request. Uh, there, uh, there are uh, 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 different other metrics on which, on behalf of which, uh, it, it gave the visibility of the overall application, uh, overall application performance for us. Let me quickly go back to past 30 minutes and let me load that data back up. Get back into my dashboard, my application. Hmm, seems to be a bit of a cookie thing that might be going on. Let will go back to past six hours. Yep, over here. Okay, so if I move along uh, along this particular graph, it would actually show me uh, well, uh, what is my application response time at each of the particular time uh, each of the particular time window. And then um, at this particular point, there is more data is getting pumped in. But let's look at one of the scenario. Uh, uh, over here, the time window has actually passed. But let, let's look at a particular scenario where uh, in the past 30 minutes, you probably would have seen there have been a lot of spikes that has going on, uh, uh, have been going. And somebody has come at uh, later when that spike has passed and, and said that, you know, my, the, uh, the application was performing slow. And usual response would have been that, uh, that uh, you know, the time window has passed, uh, come, come a bit later because we'll have to take TCP dump or Wireshark to troubleshoot that kind of scenario. And, and then also it has been really difficult for the network administrators to pinpoint where the issue has been. So in, in that kind of scenario, we can actually go into logs and we capture nearly all the logs and, and all, at the same time, we filter out a lot of chattiness in that log. So if, uh, if an administrator want, it, it can turn on non-significant logs, and there would be a lot more logs that will be, uh, that would be shown up over here. But at the moment, we are showing, showing uh, significant logs over here. And if I select application response time, which has been greater than 100 milliseconds, and see if there is something that comes up, and, and there is a lot of logs where application response time has been more than 100 milliseconds, I can actually uh, expand my first log, and you would see you know, it's not at just at that particular analytics page, but even at the log level, we are able to give that information for and to an application response time, but also present all the information in a very human readable format where you could see I can, uh, uh, we could quickly get what is the client by IP location operating system. And there's a lot more information uh, from right from here. Uh, as in my virtual, this is an SSL decryption scenario because my virtual service is running on port 443 and I am making an unencrypted session with my web application at the backend on port 80. Another inter and if I move over here, uh, it actually quickly shows me that it has been a high application response time so it's not an application. It's not an application issue. Uh, sorry, it's not a network issue. And administrator can go to the application team and tell, hey, there has been some problem on the application side because this is working perfectly fine, and I have the data to prove it. But it's not about you know, finger pointing. It is also about helping each other to because at the end it is the business application uh, which has to perform and how this uh, uh, overall platform helps in in driving that success is that I can actually go on to my right hand side. There's a lot of information in terms of client analytics that is available and click on server IP over here and actually match my logs. So if you see over here, my total logs have 3,228 logs, which have reported more than 100 
millisecond application response time. And over here, the server RP of 1079 uh, matches, uh, uh, matches that application response time of more than 100 millisecond. So how easy it is to actually pinpoint where the, the issue has been arising and now the team can concentrate on this particular server to troubleshoot, uh, the, to troubleshoot the issue. Another quick one I would say, uh, see is in the logs, I see that there have been a lot of 404s that are coming up. So I can just go and simply type 404 over here in the window and uh, expand right onto my first log and it would see you know what sort of uh, content uh, from where I'm getting that for uh, 404 response time and it could it actually gives me that it has image hyphen PNG from where I'm getting that uh, 404 and now I can actually go on the URL path and so this is the URL path which is giving me a lot of 404s and this is the server from where this uh, 404s are coming. So how easy it is now for the overall operations team to troubleshoot this issue, which probably would have taken uh, a lot of uh, a lot of hurdle up between multiple teams and and still and a couple of days to just to uh, reach to a conclusion to to. Uh, troubleshoot this kind of issue, but using this, uh, using such kind of rich visibility, uh, we can we can achieve the same result within minutes. So this is how the uh, it, the platform helps in that ease of troubleshooting. Another interesting thing I would quickly show you is uh, if you click over here, you would see that it is providing you same kind of data that you would get from a TCP dump or a Wireshark. Don't have to do uh, all that feature set uh, and tool sets are built into the platform that would give you that information that comes handy for uh, for a network administrator. Okay, how are we doing on time? We are. No, very good. How would we like to proceed, Pratik? Yeah, hey, Mike. Um, yeah, we are a bit over time. Um, so, have you got much to go through, or uh, probably another t uh, ten minutes to uh, to wrap it all up, or or uh, in terms one more thing, if yeah, uh, people are interested to uh, and enjoying this demo, and then we can quickly jump go into our question answer pro yeah, uh, probably, question yeah. answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Let's do the one thing as you have. Um, and then we can go to question answer. Yeah. Perfect, sounds good. Okay, so I'll quickly showcase uh, so, uh, how easy it is to provision the, the virtual, uh, the, uh, uh, the application and or the virtual service uh, using the platform. Now, I said I can click on basic setup and I would choose my application at the moment is running in uh, Azure Cloud. Obviously, I have to give it a uh, uh, a name, and uh, it is an HTTP based application running on port eighty. I have all the parameters at the back end set up, and uh, uh, using the API that connects into uh, into Azure uh, into my Azure subscription, I'm able to pull up what uh, what. Uh, virtual network I want in my, my application is running in, what IP subnet I, I want to go and provision my VIP in this scenario. And you could see I can even auto allocate a, a, a public IP or a, or a static IP uh, just by selecting this this one in this uh, today. I'll leave it because we have a backend access into our virtual network. and and we need to give it a user-friendly name. So what it is doing is that using its IPAM and DNS, it would go and auto allocate uh, an IP address and a user-friendly name to it. Now I will just have to go and select my backend servers. Because I have that, uh, uh, I have the integration into Azure, you could see as soon as I select my subnet, it is able to pick all the virtual machines that are running into my subnet. I don't have to look into an IP address and the subnet, etc. At the moment, I'm running single 
uh, virtual machine at the, in this particular subnet, which is running, uh, which is a web server. I'll go and add it, save. And what it is now doing is that it is initializing uh, the network reachability to, to uh, the Azure cloud. It will go and spin an SC, uh, which is the load balancer into the Azure cloud. And then it will provision a virtual service uh, into, uh, into, my, uh, into my virtual cloud. So, but in the meantime, if I go and, and it will turn green in a couple of minutes, but in the meantime, let's go and look into this virtual service. So what you would see is, at the moment it is initializing, but uh, it has automatically been allocated an IP address of uh, 10183. It's running on port 80. Uh, this is the user-friendly name that has been given to it. It is, uh, it is running on one service engine, the HTTP profile, etc. All that information that you can actually get right by hovering over onto this uh, onto this place. You don't have to go onto multiple pages to get this particular information. And you could see now it is all green up and ready and my virtual service is already deployed. So what I can do is I can quickly go copy and I can go and access my application over here. So my app, so you can see you know, a controller which is running on on-prem, I can go and deploy a virtual service for an application running in Azure Cloud. And I've all, I've, spoken a lot about scalability and I would quickly show you also how how we can scale out the application onto multiple load balancers. So you could see that this application is running on a single service engine at this stage. Uh, it's right over here. It's giving me an option to scale out and I can click on it and click on scale out. And now it is doing this Okay, so this should be all good. And you could see that now this application is running on two service engines, which is uh, service engine one, with one which it was already running and it's running on service engine two. And I can similarly, I can spin more, more virtual machines in my VNet and I can spin, and, uh, and, uh, which is more SEs and scale my application out onto multiple, multiple service engine. Similarly, I can scale in or during my, my operational works such as upgrades, I can, for a headless upgrade, I can migrate the virtual service onto a new SE, and then I can upgrade my existing SE. So that's about it from the perspective of uh, you know, ease of application provisioning. So as you could see, you know, platform provides that rich uh, visibility into the overall application performance, which helps in driving the ease of troubleshooting of my applications. And, and then how easy it is to provision and manage my, my applications running into multiple clouds. This brings to the end of my demo today. Uh, over here, and uh, I'll quickly go back to my slide deck. So just to wrap up from the perspective of what benefits that the platform brings is that, you know, and, and this is not us, this is, uh, this is IDC, which is an independent organization, which has actually gone and done survey across the enterprises and the organizations which have already been consuming AVI uh, into their environment. And, and what they have been able to drive is that it helps in 97% faster provisioning of the application, which, which you could see uh, from. No, we are not, you're not, you're not, your slides are not slides moving. Are not moving. Okay. In, the, in the slide share mode, yeah. Try it again. Stop screen share. Just let me know. How about now? Yep, but it's um, it's not in full screen. You can 
phone start jam mode yeah okay. cool so it helped in uh, faster provisioning on uh, of the applications because now you can actually automate and deliver applications at scale then as a result uh, because of that uh, rich analytics that is available and automated decisions it, it helps in driving uh, the business ex operational excellence by uh, by less time spent for troubleshooting trivial scenarios like application latency. So uh, and and also you know you don't have to over provision for future and you have capacity pooling uh, feature set that is available with you where you can provision uh, available. Uh, capacity elsewhere where it is required. So all that savings that into CAPEX and OPEX helps in bringing the uh, total cost of ownership of the platform down by 30%. And, and we can actually scale up to nearly 1 million plus SSL transactions per second. I haven't seen any organization which has scaled up to that particular level, but that's what the platform can scale up to. Cool. So that was all from my side. And uh, yeah, over to you, Vincent, if you can want to summarize and go to the questions. So just not not uh, switch slides again. And maybe you can handle, um, just go to the next slide on the- Yeah, I think uh, from questions perspective, Vincent, you've been handling all the questions already. Um, given we are a bit over time as well, uh, just maybe we'll wrap up and then do the giveaway, um, and then we can close it for folks. Okay. Just want to be conscious of people's time as well. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So, so, um, sorry. Just, just one more thing before the thing. It's just very quickly. We actually have the four days architecture bootcamp that's happening right now. Uh, so you can actually register it. Um. And it's covered over four days with different topics. So I'll just have Kuma share that slide. And then, yeah, with that, thanks so much. Uh, and I'll have Kuma to go through the quiz. Yeah. Perfect. For the prizes. Share the quiz. Let me know if everybody is able to see the questions. So this is question one. What are the three capabilities of NSX ALB? Option A is container ingress, B is forward proxy, C application security, D load balancing, and E is web server. Pratik, I guess you can be the timekeeper here. Uh, cool. me... oh, are we getting people to respond in the chat? Oh, yes, please. Cool. Um, all right, folks. First in, we need to respond. What's the first one? Um, maybe give it. All right, let's do the next question, if you have one. Perfect. Then the second question is, which is not an NSX ALB architecture feature, which is central orchestration, elasticity, Automation, rich analytics, observability, or active standby HA only. All right, folks, get your answers quick. Uh, don't Google, just quick, quick, quick response. Moving to the next question in five, <laughs> four, three, two, one. Next question. Cool. Uh, do you want me to give the answer to the questions as well? Uh, maybe. Um, yeah. Okay, so the answer to this question is E. Uh, it is not just active standby, it is an active active fabric, though it has a feature to run as active standby as well. Ah, what was the answer for the first one? So the first one is uh, A, C, and B. Ah, really awesome. So a couple of folks got that right. Um, cool. And moving to question three, which is an applicable NSX ALB use case? All right, folks, which is the yes. applicable NSX ALB use case? Is this the last question, I think? Yes, this is the last question. Cool. Get your answers in by five, four, three, two, one. What's the answer, Victor? 
Cool. The answer to this question is E, all of the above. Oh, we, uh, uh, we can deploy NSX ALB into container environments, software defined data center, public clouds, and end user computing environments. Cool. Cool. So and, two, two users got the answer right for the first one, and everyone got it right for the last one. Second one, nobody got it right. <laughs> okay, so we'll come back to you in terms of who are the winners for the swag today. Cool, awesome. Perfect, and guys, I guess Pratik would have your uh, details, so we'll get the details, and you'll be seeing the swags coming at your way. What's your addresses? Um, awesome. All right. We will reach out to you folks. Also, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Kumar. Thanks, Vincent. Um, it was definitely a good session.